this next speaker is the founder of On It. Uh, they've been coming to this event for a long time. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He's the host of Aubrey Marcus podcast. He's the founder of Fit for Service Fellowship. Like that one, yes. Uh, he's most passionate about raising awareness for psychedelic medicine. And he's a 20-year native of Austin, Texas. So he's been keeping it weird for a long time. Will you please give a warm welcome to the stage, Aubrey Marcus. Thank you. What's up, everybody? How are you guys doing? I'm going to rearrange some furniture here. All right. Well, topic for today, listening through the noise. And I don't think I need to explain noise. I think we get that. There's a lot of noise right now. More than ever, actually. And this is not a situation that our evolutionary biology is prepared for. These amount of voices. And so we're going to be talking about that. But the way to actually cut through is to deepen and strengthen and train our ability to listen. Because just like if there's a din in a crowded room and you really want to hear that person, you just drop in and you focus a little bit more and you can actually hear the voice. And it's not too dissimilar from the din that's in our own mind, that cacophony of thoughts and different things that are moving in our own consciousness. And if we really want to understand where we should go, well, we got to listen. We got to listen to our own inner whispers. There's a guiding voice, a voice from that truest version of ourselves that's always whispering. Always. And we just have to listen. And similarly, there's that voice externally, as within, so without. So I'm not going to talk too much today about listening to that inner voice, although I could, because that's important. And of course, I'm off to do ayahuasca tomorrow, which actually <laughs> really forces you to listen to everything. Listen to the whole universe, listen to mama, listen to yourself. You know, find the truth through a lot of noise. And so this is a practice that I've been a part of for a long time. It's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about psychedelic medicine. It's, it's one of the tools that I have to help me listen. But there's many tools, breath work, static dance, meditation, sensory deprivation tanks. There's so many different ways to actually find that ability to listen. And we'll find sometimes that we're off down a strange alley. And this is not just in our own mind, of course, as I said, as within, so without. We'll find ourselves down a strange alley of listening out there to the world as well. And we'll be like, whoa, how the fuck did I get here? And of course, it's just we were listening. But it's always good to be a little bit skeptical and just go back to that technology of listening and say, huh, let me listen a little deeper. Let me not allow myself to just be carried on this stream of noise and see where I end up. Because that's not going to get us where we want to go. Like the deepest listening is what is required for a time of the most chaotic noise. So the deepest listening is required at the period of the most noise. And we're at the period of the most noise. There's just no doubt about it. So I want to talk about two things in particular today. One is intrapersonal listening. Right? Like, so this is what we need to do and what we have the opportunity to do when it's just you and another person. And I'm actually going to bring someone up here in a little bit to model this type of listening that I learned from Guy Sengstock. It's called circling. And it's the best and most precise listening technology that I've ever learned. So we're going to model that. It's amazing for relationships, relationships of all sorts when people are going through challenging situations because ultimately what we really want is to be heard, right? to be heard, to be seen. You know, so often we're in the process of trying to fix something before we've actually listened to the problem, like really listened. So we're going to talk a lot about that, but 
Guy Sengstock started a two-day workshop with me and a couple close friends, and he said, what is the thing about listening that you don't get? And we had a lot of bright people, myself included, and we started saying all kinds of different things. Oh, well, you know, you got to pay close attention. You got to, you know, quiet your own voices. You got to do all of these things. He's like, nope, good, but nope, good, but nope. So y'all think about it for a second and tap into your own little clever person and think like, all right, what is it about listening that I don't get? You guys got some answers percolating in your head? And then he goes, all right, I'll tell you. Here's what, here's what it is about listening you don't get. He goes, you don't. We're like, how dare you? How dare you? But after we finished the seminar, we realized like, oh yeah, oh yeah. We were kind of listening. We were approximating listening. We were approaching listening. We were on like the listening at bat circle, but we weren't really, really listening. And so there's four parts to his listening process, the process of circling. And it, it really asks you to focus on four different things. And if so, if you're talking to somebody, and again, we're gonna model this in my stage furniture. The first thing is you just express what you notice, all right? So someone is expressing something to you and you reflect back to them what they're saying, first of all, so it's a repetition, and then what you notice. And I don't wanna skip over that repetition because you'll see me do it and it's important to just let people understand that you're actually, okay, like I hear you, let me see if I got this right, right? So, you know, actually we could call that its own first step. It's just hearing, listening, and then repeating back to make sure that you understand. And that alone, even if you just do that and nothing else, people are gonna start to relax because they're gonna be like, oh, okay. Like you're, you heard me, you're listening. And there's like this drop of the shoulders, there's this deep relaxation that comes just from feeling heard. So if you take nothing else from this talk but that skill, it's a win. It's a win because it makes a big difference when people feel heard. Because otherwise they'll try to keep explaining keep explaining, explain a different way, but once they know they're heard, it's like, okay, here we are. Now we're in a different place. So then what you start to reflect back to them is what you notice first. So the first step is, I notice. And the noticing actually is very neutral, and that's the thing about all of these steps, is you're not saying what you're, what you're you know, what you're intuiting or what you're sensing or what you're what your own thoughts are on this, because that's where we often go to. And as soon as that happens, is the moment you're a little bit off course, maybe you got it just right, but the moment you're a little off course, and even as they're listening, there's gonna be a little bit of defense. But if all you're doing is saying, this is what I notice, well, it's disarming. And ultimately, there's no reason to be like, I don't know if you're right there, because you're just expressing what you notice. And that could be body language, that could be tone of voice, that could be a variety of different things. So this is what I notice. And then you can ask another question. You can continue the conversation. So repetition, repeat back to them what you notice. Number three, express what you feel, what you feel. Not feel is in the sense like, I feel like you should break up with that person. Like that's not what you feel. That's an idea that you have generated maybe from what you feel. But if you just express it as a feeling first, Okay, then you're still right, right in sync with that person, All right? So I feel, and again, it's focused on what you're feeling, not what you're sensing or intuiting. And then the third one is really, or the fourth one, is it fourth? Yeah, fourth one, really, really important. And this is where actually I think a lot of the listening fails. This is a fail point. And the language is crucial here. Because this is your opportunity to kind of piece some things together. But the word you use is, I imagine. I imagine. I'm imagining. Instead of projecting what you think and saying something like, I'm sensing, I'm getting a download, which is some appeal to authority, right? Which we always do, like, and we do that all the time. It's actually a logical fallacy when we do that. Maybe, maybe you are, but a lot of times we'll say that, like, 
I'm sensing like there's some fucking connection to some super powerful omniscient being. Of course there is, and it's you, but nonetheless, like when you say that, it's an appeal to authority. It's a logical fallacy. And of course, people should be like, meh, you sure? But if you just say, I'm imagining, it takes ownership of what your experience is and then allows you to express something without creating that defensiveness. And of course, this is one of the big issues with listening. Is everybody is just armored up. And of course, online, they're not just armored up. You know, they're armored up with all of their guns pointing out. I mean, it's guns and missiles and arrows. It's fucking wild. Like, it's full-on encampment. So the disarming is crucial. And by saying, like, I'm imagining, then you take ownership. And if you're off, then, well, that was just your imagination anyways. Right? So it allows you to maintain, like, stay in sync. Instead of just projecting and then saying that it's coming from some other place, because obviously we don't say that, like, I'm projecting that you need to talk to your dad. Like, <laughs> that really wouldn't work, but usually it is. Usually it is a projection. But if you use the language, I'm imagining. I'm imagining that a conversation with your father would go really well. Like, do you just feel the, like, feel the difference in that? It's just different. It hits different. It's like it goes, there's no need to armor against that. Because that's just your imagination, and they can take it or leave it. And so it, it puts ownership back to the person you're listening to and really gives them authority. And that's super important. And then the final stage, which is a stage that's not often expressed, number five, is I desire. Because, of course, we're human beings in relationship with somebody, or we wouldn't have this conversation. Well, I am today, and I might not be in relationship with that person, but we're modeling it. But I desire. This is what I want. This is what I want. And it could be what I want for you, but maybe what I want for you is what I really want. So you own that you have a desire. You're participating in this conversation, and you're not this unbiased, completely neutral I am stoic, I am free of desires, I am the Buddha. Not pretending that. Of course you have desires. Of course you have a desire for this situation. So then expressing that then brings you back to a place of real grounded honesty. So those are the five steps. Number one, repetition. Number two, I notice. Number three, I feel. Number four, I imagine. Number five, I desire. All right, so I want to go through this with some brave soul who has something going on. Somebody here with something going on, and I just want to listen to you. Like, really listen. All right, come on up, huh? What's your name? John. All right, give it up for John. All right, that's yours. Let's tilt these towards us. How you doing, John? Doing good. Use the mic if you would. Yeah, I'm doing good, thank you. Doing good? So what's up, my friend? Um, I'm on week nine of recovery from a bad accident. I broke my femur. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Chronic pain is... Just getting old. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is it's the ninth week recovering from a chronic accident. Nothing you planned. It's an accident. And uh, the pain. It's, it's starting to wear you down a little bit. Did I get that right? Yep. Yeah, I notice your eyes are watering, and I notice that the left side of your face is quivering a little bit, and uh, yeah, uh, it's messing with me psychologically. You know, I'm a really active guy, and it's 
kept me in bed for a month and a half, and now I'm here, normally feeling strong and, you know, vibrant, and then yeah. handicapped. Yeah, yeah. When you said um, handicapped, I could really feel, feel that that hurts to feel that way. And I could feel, I could feel the pain. The pain. I, I mean, I feel you, man. And I really do. And I could only imagine what I would be feeling in that situation, too. And, and I really feel you. And I also want to say that I feel a deep courage that's underneath that. There's a courage there that I feel, and that's it's like on the baseline beneath it all. And I feel, as much as I feel your pain, I also feel like a little thread of inspiration, actually. Inspiration that you're sitting here, that you came up, that you're sharing your feelings and, and what's going on. And I, so I feel both deeply compassionate and I feel your pain and, and I also feel a little inspired. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What happened in your accident? I was backcountry snowboarding and I hit a patch of ice and went into a tree. Yeah. And you know, it's pretty traumatic. Like it's um, broke my femur in half, so they put a three eighths inch titanium rod from my hip down to my knee. And um, I'm like super grateful to be here because it didn't sever my main artery, which normally happens in that accident. Yeah. And um, it's been it's been a journey. Yeah. You love snowboarding, huh? Yeah. Yeah, man. It's my happy place. Thirty years, and that's where I feel most alive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm imagining, you know, this feeling of doing what you love, this thing that's been your happy place. And I'm imagining that, you know, for me, and, and just feeling like, man, here we are, fucking back country, in my home, you know? And then in just one second, it goes from heaven to hell, you know? That's one moment of chaos one icy patch, and, and here you are. And I'm just imagining that situation unfold, and I'm imagining the many nights that you've thought about, a different turn you could have made, a way you could have listened to some voice or something or some way, and I'm imagining a lot of that, a lot of times asking why. Like, what fucking why? Like, 100%. Yeah. It was like the week after the accident, I was like full of gratitude, partially probably because I was on painkillers nonstop and that helped. <laughs> um, but it was more of like the medical team that finally got me out of there and got me to the hospital and that kind of stuff shared with me the week before somebody had died from the same accident. So I was in this heart full of gratitude of like, I made it and he didn't. And then I've just been like discouraged over the last like seven to eight weeks that turning from gratitude into like, why me, mm -hmm. you know? And, yeah. and just frustrated that I'm still not able to um, be back. And so I'm like a little disappointed in my own, you know, ability to just to be grateful. Yeah. I feel, I feel the additional pain of that, your own self-critic, your own self-judge and, and what I would desire from you to alleviate this pain that we're feeling is that let's get rid of that guy. Let's get rid of that guy. Like let yourself feel whatever the fuck you feel. Like if anything, like you deserve that, right? So I really, I really, really want that for you that no matter what you feel and no matter how many times you ask why that you don't judge yourself for that and you don't question your intuition and you don't put yourself in any more difficult situation than you're already in. You got a big, you got a big battle to fight, you know, with your mind and with your body. And I, I deeply believe in you because of your courage, 
that you're gonna make it through this 100%, but still allowing yourself the freedom not to be in self-judgment, not to be in self-condemnation of any sort, self-rejection of any sort, so that you can just focus on what you have to deal with in front of you. And I really, really want that for you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to express that, you know, 2018, I got into a car accident, and it was a crazy situation. I was leaving my house around noon, normal day, didn't party or stay out the night before, grabbed a sparkling water, spin drift, my favorite sparkling water. Sorry to any sparkling water purveyors out here that are not spin drift. And leave my gate, on top of the hill, driving in my Tesla, going to do a podcast with Nako Bear, one of my favorite musicians. Yeah, and uh, next thing, the first flash of consciousness I have is the jaws of life cracking the roof of my car. I passed out. I've never passed out in my life. Not from too much alcohol, not from any situation, not even from sparring. You know, I used to be in Muay Thai and boxing and I got cracked. I mean, you can probably see it in my nose. <laughs> But I never, I never lost consciousness, never once. And I was just out, accelerated into a guardrail. Guardrail cut through my face, ripped my nose off my face, cut my neck, almost could have killed me. You see these scars that are there? And uh, I woke up for a second with the jaws of life and then again in the hospital. And they were you know, trying to get me to open my phone and ask me who to call, so I called first my fiance and uh, you know the first thing I said was I'm sorry I'm sorry because in my mind then I was so worried about taking care of everybody else that the first feeling I had was I'm sorry like I'm sorry I'm not gonna be able to take care of you anymore because I'm fucking mangled but that was the key, actually, to track my own instincts. And when I understood, ultimately, why this happened, because I was asking why too, and I did, first, right out of the gate, it was, this happened for me, I just gotta figure out why. I had a lot of like faith at the start, but of course, the why would question, and I needed to find an answer to that why. And maybe this was why, or maybe it's just my own imagination. But tracking that first instinct of, my instinct was to take care of her, even when I was hurt. And then looking at my life, and all I was doing was taking care of everybody around me. And I was polyamorous at the time, so I had, you know, well, she wasn't my wife then, I didn't say wife. Um, I have a wife now, different wife. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, my, my girlfriend, time fiance at the time, and then I had other, had other partners. I had everybody, my, my friends, my company, every, I was just taking care of everybody. And I really feel that at the end of the day, the only thing that makes any sense is that some part of my soul came in and just said, enough, enough. You've taken care of enough people. Like what I really wanted at that point was for them to take care of me. And so I created a situation where the world would take care of me and that maybe I could learn that lesson that, yeah, I can take care of a lot of people, but I also need to be taken care of. And that took me a long time to figure out, you know? And so I tell that story because maybe some of that resonates with you. Maybe you take care of a lot of people. And maybe this is an invitation for you to be taken care of, to allow yourself to be taken care of by the world. And maybe that's your answer for why, or maybe it's your own answer, but also to have the faith that you'll understand at some point when it's time to understand. So just stay curious, stay with an open heart, see where it takes you. Thank you for that. I really appreciate that. At a heart level, I, 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 um, I could relate with every piece of that, you yeah. know, feeling remorseful because if the people I'm supposed to take care of, my team at work, my wife, my kids, 
Yeah. And that self-love piece. Yeah. Is it hasn't come natural to me, you know, and like it's starting. The universe is starting to show me how important it is. Yeah. We model for others how we want to be treated. As we love ourselves, others pick it up and go, oh, that's how to treat this guy. <laughs> we get it. And of course, if we don't love ourselves, we won't accept love from anybody else because we don't deserve it. And that's the voice. And so this situation presents you with myriad opportunities, many, many opportunities. And that's your invitation. There are a lot of open doors to self-awareness, discovery. And if you think of the universe as participating in an intimate love story with you, a universe that loves you and wants the best for you, then that'll help you take that invitation. I love that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Appreciate you, brother. So in, I don't know, 10 minutes, he feels like family to me. Like, like if we ever see each other in any other place, we're going to give each other a big hug. And that's what listening can do. It can collapse that myth of separation, that feeling that we're separate from everybody else, just from listening. You know, and I, I'm sure you guys tracked the five different models. And then it goes into a free-flowing conversation. We dove in into this cocoon of listening and intimacy where we're on the inside there. We're on the inside and we know that the insides are lined with love and are lined with, with really hearing each other. And then from there, you know, just take the conversation, trust your instincts, and go. So that's intrapersonal listening. So I hope you guys can take what you, take what you will from that and apply it. I've found application for that in my coaching and medicine circles and relationship and in every situation, every situation. All right, intrasocial listening. Intrasocial listening. I got three rules for intrasocial listening. The first rule, if you want to change the game, winning won't do it. You got to change the game board, right? So what we see out here, sure. We may have a side. We may have a side with what's going on in the world. Of course, it's normal. But if we really look at the meta situation, the meta crisis, the meta problem that we're facing, looking down, the problem is actually not that one side is winning over the other side. The problem is that how the two sides are engaging with each other because it's going to be a perpetual, perpetual conflict. And if we zoom out, we can be like, well, fuck. So, all right, maybe your side will win. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't want your side to win. That's normal. But if your side wins and the other side loses, then the other side that lost is just going to get more fired up and more aggressive and use more different techniques and tactical ways in which they can come back and beat you again. And then you're going to lose the next one, and then you might win the next one, and then we go back and forth, Hatfields and McCoys, for the end of time. Like, that doesn't change the game. To change the game, you have to change the game board. You have to change the way that you interact. Change the way that you look at things. And this means, first of all, really listening. Like, if you get on the listening game board, it's a whole different level of play. Because obviously, this conference is more to one side than the other side. Just fair enough to say that. And 
if I'm being honest, I'm leaning towards that side myself. However, the moment we start attacking, the moment we start denigrating or rejecting anybody from the other side, we're participating in the game that's the problem at the fundamental level. So ultimately, you'll see this on both sides. They'll talk about dehumanization. We gotta fight against dehumanization, the propaganda and the dehumanization. They're calling us domestic terrorists, the fucking sheep. I'm like, the fuck are you talking about? How are you railing against dehumanization and you just called someone an animal? It's literal dehumanization. And nonetheless, it's like, we don't get it. It's, it's like trying, like, let's say you have an old, you discover an old pile of dog shit. It's on your carpet. You're like, I know how to clean that. Let me get some new dog shit in my hand and clean it up with that. No. Not going to work. You cannot clean old dog shit with new dog shit. You cannot stop dehumanization with dehumanization. You cannot stop conflict with conflict. You cannot stop the denigration of, of sovereignty and authority with denigration of sovereignty and authority. You can't. It just won't work. So a new way has to develop. And it goes into that deeper listening. That listening may be hard. It's not going to be easy. But if you can get somebody in this situation, you know, where you're really listening, beautiful. Now, that's not always available on social media, and I get it. I get it. But fundamentally, if you're really listening, even when someone's slinging that arrow at you, if you really listen and then see what you notice, maybe you notice about the way that they're writing something, that they're aggressive or angry, like you notice, notice that they're angry, and then you feel, just honor what you feel. Man, I feel hurt by that. And you don't have to express this to them, but you go through the process. Uh, I'm imagining, this is what I imagine. I imagine that they're having a tough go. I imagine that they're scared. I imagine that they're a proponent of all of these mandates because they're scared. They're scared of dying. They're scared of being sick. They're afraid. They haven't confronted their own mortality. That's what I'm imagining. And I know what it's like to be scared. I know what it's like to be afraid. So you can imagine that, and then you can start to understand. And then, then you can go into your desire. What I really desire is for that person to feel safe. Like what I want for them is, is I want them to feel safe. Ultimately, they're not separate from me. I can't dehumanize them. I can't other them. I mean, I can, but it's not true. It'll never be true. We're all participating in a field of humanity, a field of cosmic life, a field of eros, if you will, down to the first molecule where the electrons are attracted to the nucleus, all the way up to the bigger particles, the molecules, all the way, the way that the moon is attracted to the earth by the force of gravity and the earth is attracted to the sun. We're all woven together in this inextricable pattern of allurement. We can't get out of that. And that's why the myth of separation is so harmful. And that's why when we attack someone back, we're attacking a version of ourself. And of course, this is at the deepest levels of the spiritual teaching. So what do we want? Well, maybe our, our separate self, the one that others everybody else, maybe they want to win. I want to win. I got hurt, I want to hurt them back. It's okay. And it's okay to acknowledge that and not spiritual bypass yourself to some enlightened being that doesn't have a separate self, that doesn't want to just fucking smash and be better than. So acknowledging that part of you and acknowledging also that that's a big part of this. Being better than someone else is one of the strongest fuel sources behind everything that's going on. Oh, I'm wearing three masks and a face shield because I love the world more than you do. You're only wearing one. Right? Like, it's a way, and I'm not saying that that's the motivation for everybody, but it's a slippery, slippery game of showing that you care more, which makes you a better person, 
And it's just a way to try to assert dominance into a different, different vector, right? Like, that's all the separate self is trying to do. It's just trying to be better than. It's always just trying to be better than. It only knows itself in relative position to everybody else. It's the only way that it can know itself. And again, the separate self, you could call it ego, but ego means a lot of different things. But it only knows itself in relative position, so it always just wants to play the game in which it's winning. How do you know if you're a good basketball player? I don't know. Fucking play basketball with other people. It's the only way to know, right? Like, that's the only way that the separate self can know and validate its own internal worth. So it's always trying to play that game. So we can also see that. All right, I get it. You want to be better than me. That's okay. I have parts of me that want to be better than you. And you can watch those parts come alive and accept those parts too. And then all of a sudden, this interaction has changed. Even without you saying anything, you just see them in a different way. And when you do that and start to see yourself and start to see them in yourself, just different, but same, that changes the game. Not winning the argument. What changes the game is changing the game board itself. And that's moving from the separate self to the connected self and really looking at them as if they were you living a different life. Because they are. Rule number two. Two. Rule number two, only take arrows in a cause that matters. A lot of things we can fight for. And again, fighting for is a lot different than fighting against. Fighting against perpetuates the conflict model, perpetuates the fighting against model, which is not going to work. But fighting for is important. But what's crucial is that you only take arrows in the cause that matters. Because what you don't want to do is be have a, something that you really fucking care about and you want to fight for, and then you just casually throw out some other shit that you kind of don't really, haven't really researched and don't really know that much about, but you throw out some other shit, and maybe you're a little bit wrong even on that other shit, but you don't really care about it anyways. So you're just kind of lobbing it out there. And then all of a sudden, all of these arrows come in from the side, and you're like, oh, shit. And then you got to turn your whole attention and consciousness to this attack. And then you got to be like, well, shit, do I apologize, or do, do I double down, or what, what do I do? But all of a sudden, you're in, a, you're in a fight that you had no intention of being in. So, like, understand that we don't want to be fighting everybody all at once. That's probably not a good strategy. You know? That's how you lose a lot is when you're, so focus on that thing that really matters, go deep, understand, and then go for that. And don't expose yourself unnecessarily to other vectors of attack. Because otherwise you're just gonna have to divert your energy and resources to all of these other things. And you can literally be looking at some issue that you really care about, have this one thing that you casually threw out, and that could be the blow that ends up being the kill shot. Right? Like, that's not what we want. So pick your battles. Pick your battles. Pick what you're fighting for. And make sure that it matters. Make sure that it matters. It may matter for you. You know, that's, that, that matters. If it matters for you, great. If it matters for the cause, if it matters, like, decide what matters and make sure that your participation matters and what it matters for. Last rule that I'm going to share is <clears throat> don't trust your instincts. Now, I'm going to explain this. It doesn't mean don't trust your intuition. That's a different thing. But your instincts are formed based upon tribal dynamics of your evolutionary biology. That's your instincts. It's your instincts like a, like a cat has instincts, like a wolf has instincts. Your instincts were formed a lot, lot, long, long time ago. And by nature, your instincts work on heuristics. So heuristics are shortcuts. They're ways to come to a conclusion quickly without having to actually think about that. <clears throat> so if we're trusting our instincts that are built 
from thousands and thousands of years ago. When we were in bands of maximum 150 people, and now we're connected pretty much to half the world through social media. I don't know what the latest social media numbers are, but it's ridiculous. We're connected to that many people. The instincts are gonna need to change. So instead of trusting your instincts, we need to train our instincts because our instincts are trainable. They're trainable for this different environment that we're in. My stepfather was a SWAT team officer in Compton. And he talked about how much training they had to go to retrain their instincts. All high level operators go through massive processes to retrain their instincts. Because if you see something gnarly, your first instinct is to freeze. Like that's what, he, that's what he's expressed. And I've noticed that in myself, right? Like I feel like I'm a capable guy, but I haven't trained my instinct not to freeze. I mean, I'll tell you a crazy, <laughs> tell you a crazy story. So we, I was in Australia studying abroad in University of Queensland and one of my flatmates, this guy had a trick where you could light rum from the spout of a bottle on fire and then it would go out in his mouth by the time it reached it, right? Aussie guy, real bloke, real aka. So he tried it with overproof rum, tried it with overproof rum. <clears throat> so a higher alcohol content. So he goes to do the trick. The alcohol doesn't go out. So it's burning in his mouth. He spits it out, covers his face. His face is on fire. His face is on fire. And there's five of us there. And we're just looking at him like, what the fuck? <laughs> Your face is on fire. <laughs> like, now, if you were like an EMF or an officer, an operator, what you train yourself to do is not to freeze. That's your instinct. It's like, I don't understand. I can't compute this situation. So you build your own heuristic. Oh, fire. I know what to do in fire. You smother it. And, and we, had, we had fucking like uh, kitchen towels there that we could have used to help them smother the fire. We had a rug that we could have like picked up. There's lots of things that we could have done, but nobody did shit. Why? Because we hadn't trained that instinct. We hadn't trained our heuristic, made that heuristic to actually understand what to do. So we didn't do anything. I finally, and this was not the right instinct, this was not the right thing, but there was a kitchen sink. So I flip on the water and I start like trying to splash water on his face. I don't know if that makes, I think that probably made it worse. But in those situations, we have to train ourselves. So in this situation, in this radically new environment that we're in, we have to train ourselves to respond differently, to act differently. And there's lots of different ways that we have to train ourselves and we have to help train others. I mean, one of, these, one of these situations is, let's say you see a bunch of people saying the same thing about a person, right? See 20 people saying the same thing about a person. Well, naturally, our instincts, based on this tribal dynamic, well, if 20 out of 150 people are saying something, where there's smoke, there's fire, bro. It's gotta be something. Because if 20 out of 150 are saying something, that probably means there's some shit going on. But if 20 people are projecting out of a potential, I don't know if it's a big celebrity type of person, millions and millions and millions, it's a fraction, a fraction of people with their imagination and projection. So maybe it doesn't mean anything. Maybe it doesn't mean anything. So we have to train like ourselves to like, okay, let's really look at the facts. Let's give them a chance to address this. Let's see without leaping to judgment first. And there's myriad ways we have to do this. We have our own biases. We have to retrain ourselves to understand our own biases, understand the our own desire to jump on a piece of information and say, see, I can told you, without actually even looking at it or really understanding it. And just retrain our ability to both receive criticism, to listen, to understand what's happening in the world. It's a whole different operating system that we have to download. And the first thing is to take a step back and then decide how you want to retrain yourself. And to retrain yourself in a way that's going to build this more beautiful world 
that our hearts know is possible, as Charles Eisenstein says. Because that's what we want. That's what we want. So those are the three rules that I have for intrasocial. And then there's the five methods for the interpersonal. And we'll get to questions here in a moment. But I also want to just go back to where I began and say the first place to start this listening and start modeling all of this is with yourself. If you want a world of love, love yourself. If you want a world of forgiveness, forgive yourself. If you want a world of joy, be joyful. If you want a world of laughter, laugh. If you want a world lived erotically, where every bite of food, you can taste the ecstasy in it. Every kiss from your lover is magical. Every sip of coffee is like a warm hug from an old friend, like my man down here. Then live that way. Model the world within yourself. And then watch the world change. And that's what I have for you guys today. Thank you so much. All right, we have about eight and a half minutes for questions. And I think that's probably the microphone for questions. So whoever wants to ask a question, just jump up there. I'm patient, so no worries. I don't know if that's a sign of a really good talk or a really shit one, but. Mine is strictly a selfish comment. I fucking love you. Oh, I love you too. And that's all I really wanted to share. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to pick this up because I'm tall. So in question to your upcoming journey and your ayahuasca adventure, and I know in listening to your podcast and connecting with you, you've done a, a lot of inner work, both through the medicinal properties and also just with yourself. Do you have a modicum that you have learned through ayahuasca journeys, et cetera, that you use or employ when you do those journeys that you can also employ in your own time, in your own home, in your own space? that you've found works incredibly well and you continue to repeat over and over as you go through the journey? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, uh, obviously there's many things that I've learned for different periods and different stretches. I think one of the big things that I learned in the last round of ayahuasca was because of how difficult it was. And I had to learn a new skill. And that new skill was really, really loving positive self-talk. Because it was so intense and like I felt like I was a 120 watt light bulb and they were trying to push 1220 wa watts right through it like so much energy and like I was tapping and I was breathing and I was shaking and I was just trying to move it but all I really wanted to do was curl up in the fetal position and have someone hand me lip balm which I was too fucking I couldn't even get I just I want lip balm and the cuddle please like I'm so thirsty and I want to vomit but I don't know which one first and in that position I had this voice that came through and it was the voice of myself and it was a loving loving maternal-ish father voice and it was saying like it's all right buddy I know like I know I know I know it's hard like, you got this you got this I know and just telling myself like I know I know it was allowing myself to be heard and comforted. And that's really all I wanted to hear. Like, I know, I know, I know it's hard. And I learned to pattern that loving voice instead of that tough, suck it up, accept, surrender. Mm -mm. I know all those lessons. But what I needed was that really loving, tender side of myself to step forward. So I've tried to carry that through. 
And of course, yes, those other lessons are always, always available. You know, can you really accept, accept the situation that you find yourself in without trying to change it? Because that's one of the beautiful things about ayahuasca. You can't change it. <laughs> can't change it. So how do you accept something that you can't change? I mean, you can try a, a million of the things that I was doing, but, and that's fine. But there can be acceptance underneath all of that and like a deeper, deeper acceptance, acceptance of all of it, acceptance of the dark visions, the light visions, how you feel, all of it, just radical acceptance. And so that's a constant lesson that I'm always learning. How much more can I accept? You know? And acceptance is the first step to real surrender, which is obviously where you're going. So those are some of the key, key lessons from the journey. My man. My mellow. What's going on, man? Firstly, I love you, bro. I'm I love gonna, you too. I'm going to piggyback on what Cole said. And um, I, I appreciate everything that you're putting out here. It's always brilliant. So thank you for being who you are. Thanks, huh? Yeah, yeah, fam. Um, in light of what's been happening with everything with paleo effects, and I know you know what's going on with the whole dynamic around racism. And um, I'm looking around, and I'm one of the three people of color that I noticed in this entire uh, in, in this entire circumstance here, um, the the ability to listen uh, in these conversations around racism and to really listen in into the dynamics around privilege and, and stuff like that, I find is really challenging for people that are uh, that that are consider themselves Caucasian or white or whatever mm -hmm. you you want to call it. What would be your recommendation? for the people that are here to be able to lean into people of color and actually listen uh, to, to in the, with the five steps that you, mm -hmm. that you gave out. Because um, this, is, this has been a conversation that I've had with a lot of people and there's a lot of freezing and I do a lot of the listening the way you say, mm -hmm. the listening's not happening on the other side. So mm -hmm. what recommendations would you have for that? Well, remember the, first of all, remember that first lesson that guy said what's the thing about listening that you don't get you don't you don't so you may think that you understand the issues you may think that you understand what it feels like to be a person of color you fucking don't you don't so you can get close if you really really listen and open up that space to listen so instead of just judging this way or that, like listen, listen, listen to people on, on every side. And, and that's, you know, one of my best friends, Makad. He's a person of color, African American. And, you know, he's, it's been a challenging past couple years, you know, really. And we actually got to go through this listening workshop together. And to really listen to his whole life and to li really listen, like I kind of got to get a little bit closer to understanding, but to know that I still will never know. Like we can't know until we know. You don't know what an avocado tastes like until you fucking taste it. Like you just don't know. So my advice would be to do your best to really, really get in on the inside, like get right in on the inside and listen to everybody and just let them know that they're heard and that they're loved. And, and that's, that's the biggest thing, you know. If everybody really feels heard and really feels loved, then that changes the game. It doesn't just win the side. It changes the game. So, you know, and it's, it, can't be, it can't be anything but the most earnest, deep intentions of just listening, not presuming anything, but really listening. And uh, that would be my advice. Thanks, man. We appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you too, brother. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the context of changing the, um, the, the game board that you explained, what is your, your strategy to um, address, uh, for example, a violence or a personal attack uh, while keeping a shiny heart or keeping a loving heart yeah. in, the, in the doing? What, 
mm -hmm. what can we do in these kind of situations? Right. I like the metaphor of a rose. Like think about a rose, right? Probably think about the flowers and the petals, maybe the smell of the rose. Let's say that that's the loving heart, the flower. Okay, we'll travel a little bit down a little bit further and you see the stem and what's on the stem? The spikes. The spikes, the thorns, right? And it's okay to have barriers, boundaries, thorns. And what are the thorns saying? The thorns are saying, don't fucking trample me. Don't you dare trample me. Like if you're careless and you're not, uh, come, smell my scent, taste my pollen. But if you come to trample, you're gonna get cut. And it's not attacking, it's just holding that, holding that boundary. Saying like, here's, here's too far. And so I think it's important to be both the flower and honor that we have thorns, you know, and honor that aspect and then go down a little bit further. All right, we're gonna see, first of all, leaves, leaves stretched up to the sun, soaking in the sunlight, using that as energy, literally sunlight of all of life and then go down further and you have the roots roots that are reaching down grounding you and then those root systems coming up being a part of different rose bushes connected to your community i mean you can take the analogy of the rose all the way to understand how to step forward so yes keep your flower open but your thorns present your leaves stretched up to the sun your roots connected to your community. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, everybody. So much love. <laughs>